Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening uh, uh, and a very, very warm welcome to this um, event, which is to consider a hundred years of military mental health. Uh, and uh, I hope that you will find this um, not only a stimulating presentation, but also an opportunity for uh, a great deal of interactivity from questioning from the floor. And uh, I think you'll find that this is a a field in which not only does King's excel, but in which it retains a very, very keen uh, and uh, um, um, active interest. Um, I introduce myself. I'm uh, Christopher Geis. I'm the chairman of uh, King's uh, College Council. Uh, I was an alumnus of war studies here, um, uh, which... Uh, was a very long time ago, but which very much uh, informed a lot of my, uh, my subsequent life. Uh, I was a, um, uh, a bit of a soldier and a bit of a diplomat um, and a bit of a, a public servant. Slightly haphazard journey through life. Uh, in any event, uh, I've happily landed back here at King's and it's my absolute privilege uh, to uh, give support to uh, the uh, principal and uh, his senior management team in all that we do in very, very exciting times uh, for Kings. So this evening, um, we will be uh, considering, as said, military mental health uh, marking the centenary uh, of the end of World War I. Um, now, of course, four days ago, we commemorated the centenary of the armistice and I dare say we've all probably put our poppies in the bin or they fell down the back of the sofa uh, and we rather assume um, that that is that but of course a hundred years ago um, you might suggest that the armistice was really only the beginning and only the beginning for much of the material under discussion this evening and to some extent, I think King's would like very much to be associated with the effort in examining, considering, ultimately what leads to treating matters of military mental health. It's been in our bloodstream really since um, uh, matters, matters military, since our foundation. We care very much about it, and as said, uh, hope very much to be able to be at the leading edge of this work uh, in, in the time ahead. And what keeps us at the leading edge um, includes the individuals sat here this evening. Uh, Professor Sir Simon Wesley is uh, Chair of uh, Psychological Medicine at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, one of our, the great jewels in the Crown of Kings, and he has more than one hat because he has an association also with, uh, with war studies. Um, and, um, um, just in parenthesis, happens to be president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, to boot. Um, he was, is, our first, Kingsley's first ever Regis Professor. He was appointed in 2017 as uh, Professor of um, uh, Psychiatry. A Regis Chair which not only recognizes Simon's uh, illustrious contribution to the field, but also for the future, puts the place of kings in this field um, in a place of great certainty for the future. Uh, and I think the Regis Professorship, the Regis Chair, will continue to draw talent, um, which I hope will meet the standard that Simon has set in his own tenure here. Um, to uh, Simon's left uh, is Professor Neil Greenberg, um, who is Professor of Defence uh, Mental Health at King's. Uh, he brings the smell of cordite to this discussion, having spent uh, 23 years uh, in the Royal Navy and uh, having endured the, um, uh, the rigours of the All Arms Commander course, um, uh, brings uh, a green berry to bear on these proceedings too. Um, Neil is uh, an advisor to the academic department of military mental health and uh, also runs March on Stress, which is a um, uh, psychological health consultancy. 
And then at the end is, uh, is Melanie Waters, who is the Chief Executive uh, Officer of uh, Help for Heroes, uh, formerly a Chief Executive at the Poppy Factory. Um, Help for Heroes, uh, of course, formed by uh, Bryn and Emma Parry, which has did so much, I think, to capture public sentiment and indeed to some extent was a lightning rod for that sentiment during the very kinetic wars in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. Um, uh, Melanie was uh, the first uh, chief executive officer uh, of a, a military charity while at the Poppy Factory uh, and has now um, joined uh, Help for Heroes uh, at a time when um, it's fair to say uh, the military charitable community uh, needs to uh, needs all the help it can get, but also is very, very concerned to direct its effort in ways that uh, also support the work of what we're doing here. So um, with those words, uh, again, uh, I welcome you all. We're thrilled to have you here uh, and look forward to the various presentations to follow. And I'll open, if I may, by inviting Simon to address us first. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. In fact, the, the Regis Chair was awarded to Kings for our work, um, not me, so, and I was lucky to get that bit, but the main reason we got it, well, the only reason, was that it was our record, which actually is directly relevant to what I'm going to start off by talking about. We're talking about 100 years of um, military psychiatry, so I'm going to do the first 99 years, and then these two will do the next one. Um, but. Uh, and it's a summer, if we go back 100 years, as I, I assume you noticed, for the last four years we've had this huge commemoration of the First World War. I assume you all picked that up, didn't you? Yes, you did. Well done. Although we are the only country, apart from Australia and New Zealand, of the combatant nations who have celebrated, commemorated in anything remotely. Uh, no other country has commemorated this in the way that we have. Literally no other country that was involved. And what's quite interesting is as you looked at all the various programs from the new documentary, the dramas, the, the, the ones running along like um, Holby, not Holby City, that's something completely different, isn't it? Um, so what happens when you don't use PowerPoint, you just go completely start talking nonsense from the beginning. Um, but uh, the, the, the one with all the servants, Downton, thank you, Downton, Vicky <laughs> Blinder. All of those um, have had themes running through them. There has not been, uh, I have not noticed, a recreated documentary, drama, etc. that did not really use shell shock as one of its very dominant themes. And the theme of shell shock has become symbolic in many respects of our First World War memories and experience. And it is a wonderful word. Shell shock is a beautiful word. It doesn't translate into any other language, but the word conjures up the image of the shell, which kills 50% of the casualties of the First World War, the damage the shell does to the body, to the mind, and indeed to the whole of society and culture. And, um, and then if you think about shell shock, most of you will probably say, well, yes, that's what we now call PTSD. Back then they didn't recognize it. Indeed, they probably shot you if you had it. And uh, now we do everything better. Uh, and oh, and by the way, isn't that what the war poets had? And um, every single thing I've just said is completely wrong, okay? They're all completely untrue. So shell shock had a very short life, and uh, the reason uh, well, it's quite relevant to today is the person who first described it was Charles Myers. He, was a, he called himself a psychologist. Um, he was actually a psychiatrist, a medically trained doctor, but in those days, psychiatry had quite a stigma around it. So nice to see we've moved on since those days. Um, but anyway, so he called himself a psychologist, and indeed, he was the first chair of psychological medicine here at King's, and I'm his direct successor. I have to say, he didn't stay very long. He buggered off to Cambridge um, after a couple of years. I imagine they paid him more or something. I don't know, but he did. But we still, we still claim him as our own. And Charles Myers, in 1915, wrote the first description of shell shock ever, and he invented the term. Um, it was not PTSD. It was a very neurological disorder um, with uh, funny, if you see films of it, you'll see people making all sorts of strange movement disorders, very great difficulty in walking. They may have forgotten them, lost their memory, uh, perhaps gone blind or deaf, and had all sorts of very strange signs and symptoms that were, were not uh, familiar to the doctors at the time. The only thing they didn't have is the feature of the flashback. This is now, which we see as characteristic of PTSD, which reminds us that in psychiatry, our disorders change as culture and society change, which is why psychiatry is so interesting and the rest of medicine is so dull. Um, but, so he invented shell shock in 1915. 
And not only was it not known about, very rapidly, uh, it was impossible not to know about it. And certainly, very quickly, the average RMO on the Western Front would have known more about the behavior of men under stress than most psychiatrists would in their entire career. The numbers grew and grew. And even by, by 16, there was what was sometimes called the crisis of shell shock or the manpower crisis. The numbers had got so big that it was impossible in any shape or form to ignore. And uh, the same happened to the Germans, the same happened to French. Now, previously, They've been treating them by sending them home to the big asylums. Um, and, and, and indeed, the Mosley Hospital opened that way, and many others did as well. The problem was they weren't getting better. And that this, therefore, focused the military mind. Already, they were um, having a manpower crisis, and uh, shell shock um, needed to be treated rather differently. And so what happened in 1916 was a change. Instead of sending people home for lots of treatment, therapy, whatever, pretty crude, to be honest, they decided they needed a new way of doing it. And so then they started to set up huge tented encampments in France called shell shock hospitals, one, two, three, four, and five. Any of you ever done the channel tunnel run? Have you taken your car through the channel? Put your hands up if you've done that. Have you done that? OK. How many of you stopped at the Emmanuel Leclerc? And when you got there, to immediately stock up on booze. There's a huge Emmanuel Leclerc. As soon as you come on, yeah, you're all nodding. You're not willing to admit it, are you? But, but you all did. Right. That's shell shock hospital number five. That's exactly where it was. And next time you go, you'll see around the corner an old building, which was the old officer's mess. It's the only bit that remains. And so these were treating thousands of people over short periods of time. They treated them quickly, what they called immediacy. They treated them as close as they could to um, the, the, the places of action. Uh, that was proximity. I should do that the other way around, actually. So it's proximity first, then immediacy as quickly as they could with the expectancy that they would recover, which became known as PI, became a military acronym. Proximity, immediacy, expectancy. That moment is the beginning of modern psychiatry. That's where modern psychiatry comes from. So every time we talk now about home treatment, crisis intervention, etc., that has come from uh, military psychiatry, although most of my colleagues would be shocked to learn that, but that is the truth. But still, the numbers went up and up and up. Um, then views started to change, turns against shell shock. Myers uh, is, um, loses his job. Uh, it was felt that shell shock had just become too easy, a way of avoiding your duties. He's replaced by Gordon Holmes from the National Hospital for Neurology, just up the road, Irish neurologist. Even his obituary said, even his friends would not call him empathic, which is quite, quite a thing, <laughs> quite a thing to say. Anyway, and he believed it was pretty largely malingering, if I'm being honest with you. So the war ends, and they then set up a royal commission to find out what had gone wrong. And um, this is what we do in this country. I'm leading one now. It's not a royal commission, but it's an independent inquiry. This is what we do. And this one, it heard from various people who said shell shock was the inevitable result of industrialized warfare. Nobody could withstand uh, the pressures of trench warfare for, long, for that long or the periods of time they're expected to, and uh, breakdown was uh, inevitable. Myers himself didn't even give evidence. He could see the writing on the wall. But the evidence they preferred came from other people. Lord Gort, who had the VC, said that shell shock is a regrettable weakness. It doesn't happen in well-trained uni well units. And uh, Charles Wilson, who would be better known as Lord Moran and Churchill's doctor in the Second War, in the First War, he had a distinguished career as a regimental me medal officer, and he came along and said that shell shock is feminine. And for the Edwardians and Victorians who fought the First World War, feminine is, is, is not a term of endearment. And so the view was that really shell shock was actually about the change in the nature of the men. Um, the, the original professional soldiers had largely disappeared by 16, to be replaced by a volunteer army, very patriotic, but not really professional. And finally, worst of all, conscripts in 17. So it was about selection. If you got the right stuff, and one of them actually used that phrase, you wouldn't have shell shock. And it was about cohesion, and it was about leadership. And it was about not calling it shell shock. So shell shock was banned, disappears not to return, except in every single time uh, Theresa May is mentioned, or a football manager, or whatever. So it's entered the language where it's you know, absolutely uh, entrenched, as it were, um, and part of our culture, but it's disappeared from medicine. And by 1939, when we start the Second World War, the view is that um, they have a committee, they always have a committee, and the committee said in the forthcoming war, there will be no shell shock, no diagnosis, Nobody will be allowed to leave the army for psychiatric reasons, and nobody will be paid a pension.
And that view was where a democracy did not survive Dunkirk, but of course in Germany and the Soviet Union, which had a similar view, that view um, stayed and indeed um, became even more radicalized as the war went on. And it's not until 1980 that we finally have a diagnosis of PTSD, which we inherit from our friends in America, um, from the, um, the, 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 uh, the attempts of American society to come to terms with the war in Vietnam and the damaged Im image of the veteran, both a damaged veteran and also their damaged image because of the um, perceived conduct of, of uh, soldiers in Vietnam. And that is where the new PTSD emerges. We ignore it because it's American and we weren't in Vietnam, but we have to change our minds uh, as we have the big civilian disasters of uh, Herald of Free Enterprise, Hillsborough, um, what else the other one, King's Cross Fire, and things like that, Bradford Fire. And so gradually for us, PTSD emerges not from the military, but from civilian life into the military. And, um, and then, of course, it does start to, particularly in, in the late 90s, um, gain uh, more credence in, in the British military. Uh, and indeed, that, that's how we are today. But what hasn't changed is the general doctrine that begins with Myers, begins 100 years ago or 102 years ago, um, that still to this day, the basic military doctrine we use for treating acute casualties um, in war remains based on what happened after the Somme. We will treat them with, again, as quickly as we can, as near as we can to where they are, and with the expectancy that they will get better. And as I say, that is also how we really, the, that's the basis also of the modern um, different schools of crisis care. So in that then, in five minutes or whatever it was, um, is what 99 years of military scattering, and um, time to hand over to Neil to tell us the last bit. <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> Well, thank you, Simon, for, for a great introduction uh, and uh, a good historical uh, overview. Um, I'm going to give you a slightly different perspective. So I spent uh, nearly 24 years in the Navy. Um, I joined as a, a medical student, actually, and then um, was lucky enough to go to sea uh, for a year, um, wandering around the world, going, we went on a global trip. It was fabulous. I was a general doctor. And I have to say, my experience as psychiatry at the time was very much about people who were homesick. They were a long way from home. But to be fair, having a very nice trip, uh, going to some very exotic places. I then spent seven months on a nuclear submarine, uh, which was quite cramped and a bit smelly. And I have to say, at that point, my, I was interested in psychiatry, but I could definitely see the impact of being squashed into a tin can with 130 uh, other people who, um, and actually we had smoking at the time as well. You could smoke on nuclear submarines, which was bizarre. It's clearly it's banned now. Um, and it, so when the actual hatch was opened, the, all the frustration uh, was really vented, um, often with a lot of alcohol in various interesting places around the world. Um, and that was viewed at the time as being a very healthy way to, uh, to decompress. You know, maybe now I might have a slightly a different view. And then I was lucky enough to spend a year and a half with the Royal Marines and went and did my commando training and ate lots of mud and all that kind of silly stuff. And again, what you saw there was incredibly tough circumstances, but really highly motivated individuals who were going to carry on going no matter what. And I remember as a junior doctor having a guy come to me uh, who had been uh, to the, the all-armed commando course three times and failed each time because of physical injuries. And he was probably in his mid-30s at that point, and he wanted to go back and do it again. You know, I remember having this discussion saying, you know, do you really want to do it? You're getting older. And to be fair to him, he said he did, and he went along and he passed. Um, I don't know what damage it did him. But the, the certain sort of element of, of keep going no matter what works really well from a physical point of view. Of course, what we know is over time, that keep going no matter what doesn't always work so well from a psychological point of view. Um, and that um, we have found in, the, in the, the military that over years, our work at the King Center for Military Health Research has been looking at the mental health of troops uh, progressively since 2004. In fact, Simon started the unit many years ago with Gulf War Syndrome, but that's a different story you won't get into just at the moment. Um, and thinking about PTSD, about the mental health of deployed troops, what we've showed is for the first kind of four, six, eight years of the operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, there really wasn't a very obvious rise in the rates of PTSD in troops, which, which is surprising, isn't it? You know, that you send troops to horrible places. But actually what we found is over time in our most recent uh, survey of, of our cohort, uh, which was published in the British Journal of Psychiatry just last month, has shown that actually the rates have gone up. 
Now, they're not tsunami, they're not uh, exploding time bombs or any of the horrible phrases that the Daily Mail would use. But definitely now we do see an effect of military service on, on the rates of PTSD, which, which are higher than you would find in the general population. And perhaps what won't be so surprising for you is the rates are highest in those who have left the military. Now, we can't yet tell you why that is, because we know that people with PTSD are more likely to leave. Um, but we also know that actually once you leave, you also leave the supportive environment of your colleagues and the armed forces, and maybe that's what causes it. So we're now academically doing some sort of boffinism, trying to work that out. Um, it's, it's definitely a word, honestly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it's not, it will be very soon. Um, but, but the key thing is now that we know that there is an appreciable rise in the rates of, of, of PTSD you know, in military personnel, particularly veterans. And I think certainly from a society point of view, uh, you may be aware yesterday the veteran strategy was launched by the Ministry of Defence, which sets out in very broad terms its intention over the next uh, few years to do with uh, veterans' health and, and veterans generally. And there is a huge amount of support of different sorts that I'm sure Mel will touch on, just setting you up for what you might speak about. Um, <laughs> Uh, available to veterans, but it's really varied. And I have to say, just a couple of years ago, if you put in veterans mental health into Google, you know, thinking I'm a veteran, where do I seek some help? I don't know where you would have started because you get so many hits that trying to decide whether you want to go swimming with dolphins, which is one of the therapies, uh, and it's probably quite nice, never tried it, or, or whether you want to go to an NHS veterans clinic c can be really quite daunting at times. Um, so just, just to put some additional uh, sort of uh, gloss on this. One of the things that actually the military has done incredibly well over the past 15 years is to, is to fund our department to do some research. Uh, and I mean that honestly because if you look at other um, wars and conflicts, we really didn't know what the impact was. And we now have a really good idea. We also have a really good idea about the sorts of things that help troops. So Simon spoke really usefully about PI, about the principles that were developed uh, in the First World War, um, which have helped keep troops functioning. And actually, the Israeli military have done some research showing that the use of pi or pies, we add S for simplicity on the end, um, um, has a positive effect 20 years later, that the more pies principles applied in the First Lebanon War led to better outcome 20 years later on. So this is good stuff. But we've looked at peer support in the British military, and we've led the way in the development of peer support systems, uh, trauma risk management being one of them. And this is something which really other nations haven't gripped as well as we have. And we've also stayed away from using psychological health screening. Now, every other nation apart from the UK or every other developed nation routinely screens their troops before they go away and routinely screens them when they come back. And they know that this was a good thing. Well, they did know it was a good thing until the US did the first piece of research in 2009, which showed that troops who were screened seemed to do less well uh, than troops who weren't, uh, which led them to be a bit concerned. Now, the good news for us here at King's is that um, the government, the Conservative government, were just coming in. Who knows? They may be on the way out. We'll find out. Um, they were just coming in. And in part of their manifesto, they have said, we will introduce mental health screening into Okay, armed forces, because that sounds nice, doesn't it? And Simon, in his, in his very charming way, and over more than one glass of wine, I'm sure, <laughs> managed to convince them that what they should do, rather than introduce screening, is do a trial to see whether screening works. And luckily, uh, because the US had found that screening might not work, the US also wanted to do a trial, but they couldn't do it. Because for them to do it, they'd have to stop screening some troops to have a comparison group. And Congress wouldn't let them stop screening troops. So the good news for us is we got three million US dollars to conduct a trial of psychological health screening in British troops, uh, which the government supported. So this was a great opportunity. And after three years of, uh, of doing this trial, uh, with uh, screening about 9,000 troops, uh, lots of effort, lots of money, we found it didn't make any difference at all. Um, and I have to say, going around the world speaking at conferences uh, about this has been slightly challenging at times. I've had people stand up there with microphones, not throwing them at me, but, you know, nearly. So I'll, I'll end there by just saying, yes, um, the, the military uh, has done some great things. The rates of PTSD are on the increase they're not on the dramatic uh, tidal wave um, but i think there's an awful lot of really good work going on in the sphere of, of veterans health and veterans mental health um, and i'm sure you'll hear a bit more about that just now thank you thank you, thank you neil um, 
Well, um, I'm really delighted to be here this evening. I've uh, hot-footed it down from Scotland today, so um, I've spent some time with um, the Prince of Wales at Dumfries House, where he's doing some work for veterans, which is wonderful, particularly around some of the complementary therapies, which is going to interest you, I'm sure. <laughs> Let's move on. Yes, <laughs> let's move on. Um, I suppose it's fitting that um, I'm here today when you're talking about celebrating 100 years of military mental health, partly because I conveniently happen to have been the CEO of a charity which was created nearly 100 years ago, and I'm now the CEO of a charity which was created very recently. So it spans those 100 years. Um, for, for those of you um, who know Help for Heroes, you will know that we were founded on the belief that those who gave their lives second and became wounded, injured and sick by their service, we believe they deserve that second chance at life. And that second chance is something which is vested in the principles of recovery, we call recovery, which is about having hope for the future, which is about having a sense of identity, a sense of purpose. And it's also about having your social networks, and it's about managing your own condition and your life independently and actively. And those principles are the thread that run through recovery. They also involve employment, which is something that you, you asked me also to speak, to speak about. The Poppy Factory was founded in 1922, and it was founded by a major who happened to have been discharged from the forces. He had too many uh, Russian cigarettes, I think. I don't think it was anything particularly um, awful. Um, and had awful chest conditions. And um, he decided that there were far too many veterans who were, um, didn't have a sense of purpose and that he'd come across in his life. Many of them had missing limbs, but some of them had what was called then, there was a malaise. Um, it was also, some of them were mute and it was implied that they had mental health conditions. And also, some of them experienced traumas and um, anxiety, depression, that sort of thing, but it wouldn't have been diagnosed in that way at the time. And his view was that to help them with a sense of purpose, he would create the opportunity for employment. And he wrote to his parents and said to his parents, he talked about the garden, and then he said, Mommy and Daddy, I would like to open a factory. And I think it will be an experiment, but that experiment will employ 150 disabled men. But if it's successful, it will give the disabled their chance. So what he was trying to do really there was give a sense of purpose to wounded veterans who may have various conditions. But what he also did, which plays to the recovery that we look at today at Help for Heroes, was he supported them with housing. He supported them with sport. It was bowling, it was simple stuff. He supported them with community efforts, the scouts, clubs, that sort of thing. And that enabled them to have a full sense of purpose, not just employment, to look after their families. And that's the principle that the Poppy Factory started in 1922. And if you fast forward nearly 100 years later, with many veterans charities that support mental health, Combat Strass being a very good clinical charity. When you come to Help for Heroes, we still try and engender that spirit today. And that's really about making sure that uh, men and women of the forces are able to recover, to have that sense of purpose, to be fit and healthy, safe and secure for the rest of their lives. And now today, we do that slightly differently. So we do that in a multidisciplinary approach. We're informed very well by our colleagues here in terms of how we support psychological well-being. And we do that also through sport, very positively so, and you'll see that with our work in the Invictus Games. But you'll also see that through grassroots sport, helping our veterans develop a sense of identity, a sense of social purpose, socialising in the community so that they don't become socially isolated. And those are some of the issues which we see as risk factors to mental health conditions and exacerbated conditions. We see them as risk factors sometimes if they don't have that um, when it comes to suicide as well, which you've written um, a lot of reports on, so thank you. Um, so that's something that, that, that really has developed over, over the last 11 years that Help for Heroes has been in existence with the support of the charities who have been there before. But our veterans and their families and our serving personnel still face challenges. 
And those challenges they face are about their own sense of identity, their own concept of themselves, who are they, who are they when they become a civilian, their perception of themselves that they can be a burden to their family if they're ill, and therefore that delays their help seeking. It means that they're less likely to engage with services. There's also the fact that the public have perceptions of veterans, some very healthy, positive perceptions, and some perceptions which we still, as the military charity sector and our colleagues in academia, are trying to eradicate because we want our veterans to have a full life of purpose. And we also find that some of the challenges our veterans face relate to how communities accept them. And we also find that the challenges are also how they integrate into community. And Help for Heroes always helps with that. What we also find is that our veterans have a common bond. Um, they're not a homogenous group, even though we identify them as veterans. But they find that really hard to replicate when they enter civilian society. They face the same challenges of accessing healthcare as we all do. There's not enough money, we don't have enough information. But it's something that they genuinely do struggle to um, access even more so because of the nature of their own sense of self and condition. So um, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me here today. I'm happy to take further questions. Thank you, ma'am. Well, um, uh, thanks to all our uh, panellists for those um, uh, opening reflections. And before, uh, before I fling the discussion open to the floor, I just wonder if I could perhaps um, just uh, stimulate some further thoughts in themes that perhaps might present to all our speakers. And the, 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 certainly the one that um, uh, uh, intrigued me at the beginning was to hear the way in which military mental health had been, as it were, itself systematically stigmatized by authority, such that um, descriptions of softness and being feminine seem to have gone unchallenged in describing the way in which uh, soldiers uh, and um, service, service men and women um, uh, could um, be excluded from considerations of their vulnerability to massive mental health. But I think the question I'd like to, to pose, if I may, um, is on this question of stigma. And uh, I'm one of those who might assume that the public impression of uh, former service personnel coming forward with symptoms suggests they might not do that for you know, a large number of years between, say, event and seeking help, going for the Google search. Um, and clearly, at the beginning of this period, um, uh, they were, these poor individuals were actively having that uh, interest in um, seeking help suppressed by, uh, by others. But I don't think it's fair to suggest either that stigma has entirely gone away. And indeed, even in the modern era, you know, formed military units now, albeit rather more conscious of these issues, you know, the individual once no longer serving in that coherent um, uh, unit is, of course, out there on his or her own. And I just wondered what, you know, in each of your areas, we feel that can be done to try and dissipate that sense of stigma, encourage people to come forward so that symptoms that they have you know, can be presented at a moment when perhaps um, uh, treatment is, is most efficacious. Uh, and I suppose a supplementary is, are there things that we can be doing now to cause quietly um, people to come uh, uh, forward or indeed to provide some kind of survey of military health in our services that doesn't provoke, and it does, um, uh, the sort of uh, uh, institutional resistance to the idea that we have servicemen and women who are about to be sort of medicalized from the word go. 
Um, I wonder, I wonder if, Simon, perhaps you might want to okay. lead off on that. I mean, yeah, if you, you look at the last hundred years, it, it's not a straightforward path from ignorance to enlightenment. That was the point I was making. And certainly our view that the First World War was the turning point in the recognition of psychiatric disorders is actually untrue. It was, um, and the, the lessons were actually almost the opposite that these things could rapidly get out of control. It wasn't that they didn't recognize that you could break down acutely. They knew very well that you could. And so long as the war was the cause, so long as you were treated in these big camps very quickly, bit of exercise, bit of clean clothing, sleep, uh, better diet, and then some fairly crude psychotherapy, if the war was the problem, you would get better. So they didn't have a problem recognizing that war caused breakdown. But they did think also that it was very much also related to things like um, cohesion, leadership, etc., which, by the way, are true. It is. Um, but that if you didn't get better, they were saying that uh, probably not the war at all. It's much more about you. So it's either if you're a gloomy German um, psychiatrist, they do tend to be gloomy. I don't know why, but they do. Um, it was degeneration and your hereditary, in other words, your genes. Or if you're the new breed of psychoanalysts, it was the way your parents had brought you up. But the point they were making was that long-term disorder was much more likely to be due to you. Um, for one reason or other. And that was the change that happens in the 80s with PTSD. Change in the Second World War was after our start, which we, which we didn't hold to, okay, we did start treating it better. We went back to the First World War, re relearned the lessons. And you see uh, treatment becoming much bigger. They do accept by this time that actually every man does have his breaking point using largely American research for due of ours. And they start to realize after 100 days, or was it 140 days, or something like that, of in infantry fighting, most people will have, um, will have become combat ineffective or had breakdowns. And they do create better ways of treating. But even the same, if you've read Spike Milligan's autobiography, there's still a sense of shame and stigma around those who have not quite made the grade. And, and I think that stayed with uh, Spike all his life. Uh, and it begins in the war. So, so things do change a bit. But it's PTSD, which Nen said, actually, not just short-term disorder, but long-term disorder as well, begins in the jungles of Vietnam. And that's the change with PTSD. And as ever, the truth is somewhere in between. Genes do play a bit of a part. Early experience does play a bit of a part. Personality does play a bit of a part, as does life events, as indeed does the society to which you return. We have to still explain why the Americans have four or five times the rate of PTSD than we do, despite the fact we've fought the same war against the same terrain, on the same enemy, against the same enemy, wearing the same kit, taking the same proportionate casualties, not absolute, but proportions they have, and that may be because some of this is due to the nature of healthcare when you return. On, on the stigma issue, I suppose the only thing I would say is we have to have a slightly more nuanced view of stigma. We know, um, certainly, rates of stigma have gone down. We know that. We know that people do come forward much more early. We know that. But it's still situational. So one of the studies we did, which we're quite proud of in a way, looking in theatre in, Afghan in Afghanistan and recording people's, this is military attitudes towards mental breakdown, etc., you see quite high rates of stigma. Okay, that people think less of me, it's shameful, and what are the other questions? I can't remember any of them now. Well, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, kind of thing to say. But those same people, when you survey them again, when they're in Aldershot or um, uh, Colchester or wherever, report much lower levels of stigma, suggesting that it's more goal-directed. In other words, it's not great to break down in Afghan, and they don't really like that. But if you've done your bit and you come back, then actually they're much more welcoming. And we should have a rather more nuanced view of stigma. And instead of just simply thinking of it, well, stigma's bad and you shouldn't do it. But there are times in which you can see why stigma plays a role. And these same people are capable of also having far less stigmatizing attitudes when they come back. So they don't favor breaking down when you're in Helmand. But they're going to be much nicer to you if you do it in Copenhagen. Thank you. Um, so, from my point of view, it's good to see a stereotype uh, there with German psychiatrists. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. alive and well. Uh, alive and well. Wait, wait till uh, I get going. Yeah. <laughs> um, Let's not talk about the French. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So, uh, we, we've done we've done a lot of work on on, on stigma, and actually, there, there's some really interesting findings. And one of the one of the things that we found repeatedly is we were looking at studies of stigma over years. 
Uh, and first of all, we couldn't make any sense of it because stigma rates appear to go up and down. You know, more people were reporting stigma than less people were, and it, it, it wasn't going in any direction. And then just as Simon said, then we split it between people who were deployed and people who are not deployed. And when you did that, you saw that year on year, the rates of stigma in deployed troops was going down, and year on year it was going down in troops at home. But the rates in, in theater, with the operational mindset, consistently stay higher. So that was one thing we found. The second thing is we tried to look about how stigma is linked to seeking help. Because you would think, yeah. wouldn't you, the higher stigma would mean less seeking help. And actually, we didn't find that consistently, which again is a bit confusing. So we did what I think is a really great study. I would say that since we did it. But um, we interviewed in detail about 65 veterans uh, who have had mental health problems, and, and, but not all of them knew they did. Because we, on the questionnaire, we, we knew that they did, but some of them didn't think they did. So we interviewed them in a lot of detail. And what came out from that was stigma really appears to be a barrier to seeking help the first time you want to do it. So if the first time you seek help and your experience is a positive one, in fact, you'll go back the second time and the third time, no problems. But if the first time you try and seek help, you have a bad experience, you ain't going back. And so that's why we were seeing all these different uh, associations, because it, we have to split it between at what point in your psychiatric career of, of becoming unwell, at what point are you trying to seek help? Um, and so it's more nuanced than just is stigma a, an issue or not. Another really interesting piece that came out of, of that research is, yes, stigma is a barrier, particularly the first time, but actually what's far more of a barrier is military personnel really prefer to deal with things themselves. So they have this great desire to sort it out themselves, which basically means, why do I want to seek help from, you know, that funny, weird psychiatrist bloke? I'm talking about me, by the way. Oh, um, yeah. Why are you pointing to me? Well, <laughs> we can talk about that later. Right. Um, but when actually they can sort it themselves. So some of the work that's going on now is to try and look at, can we develop a tool that would enable, probably not very ill people, but people at an early stage of distress to try and help sort themselves out, which might include help seeking, but it also might include some simple techniques that they could use themselves. So there's some really interesting ways ahead, rather than saying, you know, just try and get stigma down, which is important. If we can try and empower troops to do the things they're gonna do anyway to help their health, I think that really offers a, a really important opportunity for the future. Thank you. I mean, I think I'll add a little to that. Um, I think the thing that we've observed and some of our veterans have kind of talked to us about, particularly if they've you know, been serving for some time, is um, the important thing to them is good leadership. Um, so in-service, strong leadership provides the opportunity for stigma reduction, regardless of whether you know, troops have been deployed, whether or not they're, you know, they're, they're, they're in combat roles. Um, and that's something that, that's anecdotal, but that, that's the feedback. So good leadership and good role models. And as a result of that, regardless of whether or not they, they have a condition and they're likely to, to need to seek help, they feel that that will certainly help in the future. So when you're asking if something could be done, it's how we provide um, the chain of command with the right tools. And there is a lot of work going on um, to make sure that they are able to um, encourage um, good leadership styles um, within the forces, and particularly so where there is, you know, quite significant deployment, and even more so where there is covert deployment. Yeah. Can, can I just add to that? I mean, absolutely, completely concur, and the good news is there's evidence backing yeah. that up. But the important leaders are not necessarily what the brigadier or the general thinks. Yeah. The important <laughs> leaders is what the corporal or the sergeant thinks. So your immediate supervisor mm -hmm. is the most critical person, because if they have the attitude which is, in my team, we're all strong, that sounds good, but it doesn't really help when you're not feeling so good. Whereas if they had the attitude that in my team, anyone who's got a difficulty, we're all going to support them, we're in it together, that creates a very different attitude. And we consistently find that the rates of PTSD in troops who feel well-led by their immediate supervisor are about a tenth or half of the rate, you know, really, really uh, sort of small rates compared to troops who feel that they are badly led. So I would absolutely echo that, and that's borne out by our research as well. Which, I mean, Lord Gort was half right. It is important. It's just not the only thing. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for that. And just because this is a gathering of um, uh, King's alumni and uh, supporters, I just thought we could um, um, give uh, our uh, King's panellists at least the chance for a little bit of shop window uh, in just perhaps giving a, a sense of the research that you're engaged upon now and some of the projects that you see looming uh, in the near future. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've been doing this for 20 years. We've all got, you know, some of our favorites. The, uh, I'm not quite sure. I think my favorite one is the one you've already mentioned, but only because of the way we first, I, I had to first present the screening study, and it was at a thing called Five Eyes, which brings together five nations, Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, and us. And it was uh, top people, so it was the Veterans Administration Secretary, our Secretary of State for Defence, etc. And we, Britain chose, we each had one hour, and Britain chose to push on research, because they think we're quite good, which is nice. So I thought this would be a good time to reveal the results of the screening study to the Secretary <laughs> of State for the Veterans Administration. And um, so he was there, and, um, and it's very small, around so you can hear everything. So I presented the results, and I say, the great thing, what you went, when you like us, if you're a boffin, we don't mind being boffin, it's not, it's not a verb, um, <laughs> a boffin, what you really want uh, you know, is a good result. And a good result isn't what you think is a good result in this room, with them, but maybe you as well, something that works. No, you want a result that is unequivocal. You want it either to work or not to work. You don't want it to be more research needed. That's what a good result is. And we had a very good result. And you can see, and thank you so much for funding it, by the way, our American colleagues, what wonderful people you are. So he was beaming, he said, oh, good. He said, yeah, it absolutely didn't work. <laughs> and then you could see him, he hadn't been briefed. And then you could hear him talking to his agent. He said, what the fuck? And then, <laughs> and then I could hear him say, who the fuck funded this? And they said, sir, it was DOD, it was Department of Defense, it wasn't us. He said, why the fuck did they fund it? <laughs> and I could hear all this. So I finally had to stop and say, I can hear you, by the way. And, and by the way, you do now have a problem because the golden rule of screening, once you start, you can't stop. You can't. So even if it doesn't work, it is absolutely politically impossible to stop a screening program. So we then switched to what could he do? And well, we didn't know, nor did he. But that's, I think that is one of my favorite moments, actually. And of course, the Brits were gleaming because we've saved ourselves millions of pounds a year, which we can spend on what we needed to do, which was to improve services. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, just in, so in terms of um, sort of good papers that are interesting, a couple of them. So we did one study looking at can you use comedy as a way of reducing oh, reducing stigma, and we had a really fabulous comedian who did a lot of um, work with oh, the yeah. British troops out in Cyprus. So you may be aware that when British troops came back from Iraq and Afghanistan, they often stopped in Cyprus for 36 hours. Uh, and this guy is called uh, John Ryan, who is very funny, I have to say. And uh, so, but he's also interested in mental health. And so he in Cyprus used to stand up and do these very rude. Comedy comedy shows that when you just come out of Afghanistan for six months are absolutely the right thing. But we designed a comedy show where he introduced four or five key anti-stigma, pro-help-seeking messages. And he went up to a, 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 a battalion of, of army troops who had just come back from, they were pretty kind of sort of uh, war bound and, uh, and weren't that interested, but they would happily go to a comedy show. And half the, half the group got a comedy show, which was just funny and very rude. And the other half got a comedy show, which was uh, very funny a bit rude, but had these kind of seek help messages in, and it made no difference either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which was it did win an award for it, so that was kind of always public help. But just to answer your question, what we're doing at the moment, we've oh, got yeah, yeah so, so we've we, we've got uh, our teams our teams doing a lot of a wide scope of research. We've got a lot of research looking to military families uh, and children, and we've actually got a piece of work also on older veterans looking about the impact of military service when you're over 65, because actually. I don't know if you're aware that well over half the veterans in the UK are over the age of 65. Um, and one of the interesting findings that comes from the scientific literature, it suggests, and we're doing a study to see if it's true, it suggests that if you have mental health problems during your military service, it may increase your risk of dementia. Now, we can't promise that that is the case, but should it be the case, that obviously is a big public health issue. So we're doing a piece of work on that. We've got some work going on a moral, moral injury. This is the idea that when you're in uh, a deployed environment, sometimes you have to make decisions to which there's no right answer. Mm. You know, who do you shoot, you know, or do you shoot, or don't you? And you've got you know, three nanoseconds to make those decisions. So we're doing a piece of work to look at the uh, impact of that, because it, it's a talked about subject, but it's not really very well defined. And what we know is that veterans generally do less well with standard treatments for PTSD. And one of the reasons might be, just might be, that moral injury plays a component and the treatments we have don't really deal with that very well. So we've got, we've got that work uh, ongoing as well. So there's a couple of kind of tasters for, for what we do. The other big one is violence. Violence, yeah. Mm -hmm. We've shown that there is, um, in general, people, we, we know everyone's criminal record who's been in the military. Oh, yours is really interesting, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Confidentiality, eh? Yeah, yeah, I know. But, yeah. but we, we do. And surprisingly, those who join the military have a lower risk of getting a conviction 
uh, over the rest of their lives. So not more. Most people immediately assume they have a higher risk. And that's before you even include the fact that most of them come from Liverpool, for example. So you'd expect that to go with it. But even that, well, but basically that's true, is the fact that many of them join up already at risk of social disadvantage. They've already got risk factors. And actually, those, and, and, and when you control for that, there's a dramatic reduction in their chances of getting a criminal record. Because actually, for many of them, going to the military actually helps. Except for one thing, which is violence. And violence goes up, and it goes up when you're deployed and in combat. And that goes up. And so we're doing work now on that and who, who are the victims of violence. We suspect it's mainly domestic violence. Domestic violence, not a recorded crime in this country. Um, so you have to do rather more work to find out what was the incident, what was the crime, but it's likely to be that. And then looking at ways of addressing. That's quite good. Yeah. And I was going to mention, because Neil didn't, even though he did the work, <laughs> <laughs> um, we, um, we worked with Neil on the counting the cost study, which was to try and understand. Mm. We were trying to it's very difficult to predict who might need our help in the future um, because we don't generically capture veteran information and data. Uh, veterans do not go into a GP surgery and say I'm a veteran. Some do, but some don't. Um, so it was trying to understand who might need our help and the volumes. Um, and Neil's work demonstrated that we need, the, the, that it's approximately 66 thousand and a ninety. Not the ninety came from the modelling, but yeah. 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 It's it's can't, can't be around yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, like <laughs> um, so that was really useful for us when we're planning the services that we might offer in the future. We're also um, investing quite heavily in something called the advanced study, which is a longitudinal study um, which um, tries to understand the long-term health physiology of our veterans. I've probably used the wrong phrase, sorry, mm. of our veterans in the future so we can start to think long term and this is a 20 year study about those who are injured and had significant injuries and would have died but we saved them what will they need from the health system from services in the future because we do know that their physiology might well be different yeah. their oxygen their bloods their response to pain their response to treatment and that's something you know will certainly help us um, in terms of you know understanding their long term health needs because you know we want to help them grow old with purpose um, and we're doing the psychology yeah. social side of that that's so right yeah. 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 And another piece we're doing uh, with Help for Heroes is, is an interesting dilemma if you're a military spouse is that you have a loved one who may have PTSD or another mental health problem. You know they have, but they're not seeking any help. And so you have probably plenty of conversations, uh, maybe slightly stronger than conversations, trying to persuade them to go and get some flipping help, but they won't do it. So the, what we're trying to do uh, is to do a study using an intervention which is called CRAFT. And what CRAFT does is work with the concerned significant other, that's the spouse who's been nagging, to try and help them understand their partner's problems and to find a time to, um, to have a conversation with them, to motivate them to get help rather than to nag them. And it has a good sort of principle which is strike while the iron's cold. You know, don't have a debate when they're not doing their shouting and screaming. That's the wrong time to talk about it. Talk about it another time when it's... And so we're trying to do a study there to see whether that might be a useful way of trying to encourage people to, to get help, which we think it might be. And then one last point that Simon's reminded me, we're also doing a big piece of work looking at employment. So we managed to link our big cohort database with the Department of Work and Pensions, which was about a four-year painful experience. I had hair before we started doing it, I promise. <laughs> um, but we managed to do it, and actually we've had some really interesting findings to try and, about which veterans actually end up using benefits. And it might surprise you to know that actually veterans aren't generally unemployed and on benefits for a long time. Mostly uh, unemployment benefit is, is a short-term use if they use it at all for less than six months. The people who unsurprisingly stay on benefits in the longer term are the much smaller number of people who claim disability type benefits, which is not surprising. Um, so we're trying to do some more work on that because we really think that if we can get help veterans get into employment, mm. then actually the whole of their health, including their mental health will improve as well. And it's good for society as well. Yeah, it's a strong message that veterans are very uh, employable. We have to avoid what's happened in the US where they've created um, an image of a veteran which is much more difficult. So they're often seen as dangerous, so they pity the veterans, but they won't marry them and they won't employ them. And that's not very helpful. So we, we don't want that. We want respect, but not pity.
And there is a, a model of employability which works really well with veterans, which is called IPS, which we trialled at the Poppy Factory, which is specifically helpful for those um, with mental health conditions and also those for musculoskeletal issues. Um, and it's something that really gets someone into employment quickly and you train and maintain that employment and you work with healthcare professionals. Um, and, and as you say, you know, the rates are much better than you would get from a disabled person through the Department of Work and Pensions programmes. The sustainability rate after 12 months is about 70% in employment. The equivalent rates for disabled people generally after six, not 12 months, is 48%. So it's proving yep. successful. Here, yeah, there's a job vacancy at the DWP at the moment, isn't there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a few so more as well. Yeah. <laughs> Moving more, swiftly on from that. <laughs> um, uh, now is, I think, great chance I can do my David Dimbleby and perhaps open, uh, some, open the floor to some questioning. Uh, I think we have the the much vaunted roving mic. Um, so can I invite some questions? There's a lady here, please. Hi there. Um, thank you very much for your very insightful talks. I just wanted to return to the question of stigma. Um, I know we spoke a little bit about what the internal military stigma is towards people suffering with mental health issues. I just wondered what the stigma is from external civilian kind of forces and really what what the factors are there on some of the people suffering from mental health in the military. Thank you. And just just before um, we get to answer the question, I wonder if um, uh, you might be able to identify yourself, if, you, <laughs> if you'd be willing, uh, just, to, um, just to put our questions in context. No problem. I'm Martha Beath. I'm a King's alumna. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So just to answer that in brief, and I'm sure my colleagues might have something to say, we, we've done some work um, looking at public attitudes towards the military. Um, and uh, we're not the only people who have done it. Lord Ashcroft has also uh, done some work on this. And what you certainly find from the, uh, the public is that um, the public think that most military veterans are damaged in some way. So that 90% of us somehow have some sort of emotional or health problem. And, and although they're a bit sad about it, that's the way it is. Of course, the reality is it's almost the other way around, uh, that actually most of us are, are doing OK. So whilst that's not stigma, it, it forms, I think, the basis for the public attitudes towards towards uh, military personnel, not quite as severe as, as you might find in the States. When our, our work we did on stigma, stigma actually, which w was really interesting, we, we did a, uh, a comparison of military veterans who have PTSD and n civilians who have PTSD, who had never served. And what we thought we would find is that the military veterans would all have a stiff upper lip, you know, wouldn't be seeking any help, and civilians would be better off. In fact, we found there was no difference. That actually stigma is a military issue and an issue for veterans, but it's really an issue for society as well. And when you look at the detail of what uh, military personnel report in terms of stigma, they are, le they are wary of serving with someone who has a mental health problem on operations. So if you ask them questions, can someone who has a mental health problem uh, do their job well, they, they are more likely to stigmatise them than the civilians. Maybe that's not surprising if you're about to deploy to somewhere where your life depends upon your colleagues' ability to do their job. But they are absolutely more supportive than the general public in that saying that people who have mental health problems should get help. And I think over the last 10, 15 years, if you're in the military, you couldn't have avoided understanding that, that this is an issue, you know, probably spurred on too much by the Daily Mail. But you, know, the, you, you certainly do recognise that people who have problems should get help. So that there are some differences. Do you know which professions have higher rates of stigma than the military? You want to have a guess? Well, you're close. Uh, <laughs> doctors, one more. Much higher. MPs. <laughs> MPs and politicians have the highest rates of recorded stigma anywhere. Uh, please. Um. Um, thank you. Uh, this is Stephen Shellicum. I'm past president of the uh, Alumni Association. Uh, we've talked quite a lot about uh, uh, susceptibility um, and resistance to um, PTSD. But I wonder if you could just, uh, um, one of which I see is resistance is being British rather than American. Um, <laughs> but I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about the outcomes. I mean, the real value of psychiatry presumably is not so much in diagnosis, but actually in, in showing that that diagnosis leads to success in treatment. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that. And particularly, I take it it's not a single diagnosis, but that you can actually define degrees of um, uh, damage 
if I can call it that, in, in PTSD, and is the success, A, what is the success in treatment, and is that related to some sort of disease severity index to start with? So, um, the, in, so in the UK, our, our general treatment guidance obviously comes from NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, who are just uh, redoing their PTSD treatment guidelines. I'm, I'm on the guideline development committee, and the uh, final guidelines should be out in December, so it's pretty much, uh, pretty much there. Interestingly, the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies had their conference in Washington last week, which is a nice place, slightly cold, um, and they've just released their treatment guidance. So actually, we have a lot of evidence now on what works. Um, and what we know is that for someone who has, uh, dare I say it, simple PTSD, there is no term simple PTSD, but by that I mean a PTSD that's come on after a single incident, a road traffic accident, an assault or something like that, then actually the treatments out there, particularly the psychological treatments, the talking therapies, are really good. So um, EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, and various forms of trauma-focused CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, you're probably talking 70, 80% of people who, if you were doing okay beforehand, you had this terrible incident, uh, and you go and get treatment reasonably early on before you've got a lot of social loss, then actually you can probably do well. Of course, military personnel have often had repeated episodes <laughs> of trauma. And uh, as of, I think, July this year, the International Classification of Diseases, Volume 11, which is a great read. If you can't sleep, two pages of that before bedtime is far more effective than Zopiclone. Um, but it, we now have a definition for what is complex PTSD. So before we had PT, we've now got PTSD and complex PTSD. And what we know about complex PTSD is, unfortunately, it doesn't get better with 12 to 16 sessions quite so easily. And we don't yet know, there aren't any definitive treatment trials of what the best way is to deal with complex PTSD. The UK Psychological Trauma Society uh, that I used to live has got a set of complex treatment guidelines about how to do it. But to be fair, we are not yet in a position to say this is definitively the best way of treating it. And we can't say definitively what the outcome will be. I think probably for people with more complex conditions, it's fair to say that that treatment uh, remission is, is pretty unlikely. You're likely to be left with some symptoms. But there is a real lot of good work, including IPS that Mel spoke about. And actually, if you can get people back into a, a sensible routine, a healthy routine that probably includes some form of work, you know, supported maybe at first, actually their symptoms probably will improve over time, uh, particularly if you can re-establish their social relationships. But I think the idea of taking someone with complex PTSD and giving them you know, six sessions of something and, and curing it, I, I think, to be fair, that probably is unlikely. But great improvement and great amount of functional restoration is certainly possible. Thank you. Uh, John Mason, uh, alumni at King's College. Has there been any research done on perhaps restorative treatments, such as engaging with um, civilian populations that may have been affected by military action or, or indeed the enemy? Um, engagements which perhaps for some people who have suffered trauma they might f might find that restores some sense of well-being and coming to terms with their engagement okay. militarily thank you um, obviously our work is with British forces uh, within the British Army the word enemy of course is slang for the RAF I'm afraid um, <laughs> as Steve Gilby over there well knows. Um, but no, um, we don't, no, we just, our work we do is on UK forces, and um, so we have to look elsewhere. I think, are you thinking of things like truth and reconciliation commissions and restorative justice programs that have been used in very, very highly traumatized civilian populations? I'm not, well, I'm assuming that you are, because it's the only thing I know about anyway. Um, I'm sort of extending whether that's something that might apply in some cases, in some particularly difficult combat zones where there's trauma related, such as Vietnam, for example. Well, um, the one I, the program I'm aware of is in Sierra Leone. I've been a few times, so it should, of course, had an absolutely mind-bogglingly brutal civil war for many years until in fact a, a military intervention brought it to an end it was a very successful use of military power um, by, by, by the British but leaving behind um, a really I mean if you've been there you know everyone knows about Ebola but you see far more people without limbs than uh, than anything else 
And there they did a trial of what is basically a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, because you, I don't know if you know the history of the Civil War, but it was brutal and very savage and divided things. So they did that in 300 villages, and brilliantly, it was, they randomized it. And what they found was that actually attitudes towards um, the other side, because they all knew who had been on which side and had done the atrocities and who hadn't, did improve as a result of that. But what also changed was depression, and the people got more depressed. And it's quite, but it's a huge trial, and the findings very robust, and it's quite difficult to interpret why that happened. Um, but the, so I would just say these things are very complicated and very difficult. And um, I think, you know, people like me ha have very little role to play in it because it's really about social intervention and political interventions as well. And we don't ever advocate widespread. Um, psychological programs for traumatized communities because I think the chances of making it worse I think are much higher than making it good so social interventions political interventions uh, would be far higher on the list thank you next question we'll change the geography a little perhaps this <laughs> lady down here thank you Jenny McPherson King's alumni is a no, does PTSD occur equally in those who've had serious physical injury and those who haven't? Um, so PTSD as a, as a diagnosis is a condition that comes on if you've uh, suffered uh, an injury or seen something which is, is serious, it involves obviously threats to your own life or the lives of others or sexual assault. Um, so a physical injury obviously could lead to PTSD, um, but PTSD can also occur by you know, witnessing atrocities. It can also occur as an accumulation of repeated incidents that each by themselves wouldn't have led to PTSD, but over time you have an accumulated dose that we would call type 2 trauma, which isn't just a military thing. If you're a child social worker, for instance, you know, that, that also can have that impact. I think one interesting study that we did is we looked at uh, British forces who got evacuated uh, for illness or injury from uh, Afghanistan or Iraq and they came back to the British hospital, which is in Birmingham, and they, they got treated. So these, these are the more ill people. So unsurprisingly, we found that people who had um, been evacuated for physical injuries, they were more likely to suffer with PTSD than people who weren't physically injured. That will not surprise you. But actually, their, their general mental health wasn't that much different, but their, P, their rates of PTSD were much higher. When we looked at those who got evacuated for physical illness, what's called disease non-battle injury, you know, severe chest infections or other, they were much worse off. So they have more PTSD and much worse general mental health. That somehow coming back with a, a physical injury, whilst it's clearly not good for you, is seen to be a, you know, a heroic way of coming back. Whereas you came back with a chest infection, you know, uh, what does that say about you? Um, now, so I think interesting findings, because what it says to us is, yes, we need to look at you know, PTSD and injured, but actually those who come back for any reason early, particularly for illness, are also equally at risk. But a direct answer to your question is that if you have any long-term physical condition, you're three times more likely to have a psychiatric disorder than if you don't. But it's largely depression is actually the commonest uh, disorder uh, that you get after any long-term condition or any uh, uh, severe physical injury. Uh, obviously, in the military context, we think a lot about PTSD, but we forget about depression is a commoner condition. Even in the military, it's commoner. And we're also finding the same in, yeah. in the veterans that we see. We, we, we've helped about 20,000 um, serving personnel and veterans in our tenure. Um, and we see that the, the most common is um, anxiety, depression for those who are physically injured, um, PTSD being less likely. Thank you. It's a hand at the back there, please. Uh, there we are. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hello, my name's Stella Compton Dickinson. Um, my research was actually sponsored at the IOPPN and was conducted with um, mentally disordered offenders who have killed, yeah. from whom we learn a huge amount about trauma. Um, so my background is that over 15 years I've followed Medical Research Council guidance in developing a complex intervention for people who with serious and mental disorder um, with a a robust military history in my own family, I've considered, and also through my personal experiences of physical and psychological trauma in the course of my work, I was head of arts therapies at one of our national high secure hospitals until recently when I wrote up my doctoral research. 
Um, I'd like to firstly say how, how much I valued all that I learned at the IOPPN in health economics, and yet there's something which I question, because obviously at a doctoral level, you, you're not going to manage to get a huge sample unless you're part of a very major project, which I couldn't be, but it's still a very highly significant piece of work. Um, uh, when in following the Medical Research Council guidance for developing a complex intervention, which is now evidence-based, a form of what's called forensic music therapy, um, which is the best available evidence to date, um, now I might have a brain freeze because I've also recovered from traumas, so I'll try to stay on task, as it were, in what I'm trying to express to you. Uh, within my various publications, one, one thing that I've questioned and studied is how over the 100 years of military history, what could we learn from the fact that uh, T.E. Lawrence of Arabia had to kill he had to kill not only the enemy, he had to kill two members uh, in order to keep his troops together, um, two different members of his own forces. What have we learnt since then and the case of Sergeant Blackman, who was um, disgraced from the military service and ultimately some years later um, acquitted on grounds of having... Uh, uh, mental disorder at the time in which he shot a Taliban soldier. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, Sergeant Blackman wasn't acquitted, by the way. He was convicted of manslaughter, which is an extremely serious offence. Yeah, and he got seven years, yeah, so I, I, I did a lot of the uh, expert witness stuff to do with the, the, the Blackman case. I, I, I think the, um, the, the interesting thing, perhaps, about Blackman's case, which uh, was perhaps was very unfortunate for him, but actually probably quite good for military personnel generally who are serving is that when he was initially uh, charged with murder, which we can quite understand why, given what he had done, because he had shot an unarmed, injured uh, uh, enemy when he should not have done, for, for sure. When he was charged with murder, he had no psychiatric review. So no one checked on his mental health. His conversation with his lawyer went along the lines of his, his barrister saying, so do you think you got PTSD? And Sergeant Blackman goes, uh, I don't think so. OK, well, we'll leave that one then. So which in the courts martial service, you know, which obviously charges uh, military personnel, is wrong. If, if, he had, if that had happened in a civilian court, he would have got a much stronger offer uh, of seeing a, a mental health professional. So uh, whatever he may have done, which was incredibly wrong, he didn't get the right level of psychiatric or mental health scrutiny before he went up in front of the courts. Um, and, and so I think if he had have done, then the, the outcome would have been very different then. Um, I, I'm not sure what I can say about T.H. Uh, about Lawrence. Could I, could I actually just respond to that? Because yeah. the whole point is we know a huge amount now neuroscientifically what happens in the brain for someone who's suffered PTSD. And uh, certainly in developing an intervention that's actually used with traumatised people, um, we're looking at how we can improve how they relate to other people. That's quite easy to measure, actually, as I'm sure you appreciate, with all sorts of outcome measures. You don't even need an fMRI to do that. Um, but the, the question still remains. Lawrence of Arabia was hugely traumatised by having to kill a beloved member of, of his, his troops. He did amazing things out there, whatever anyone might think of him. And yet, there's not very much difference in the levels of compassion and understanding that I think with more mixed methods research, which is more based within treatment, multidisciplinary treatment as a whole towards um, military personnel, it's never just one thing that gets them better. It's a, certainly, it, it's a multidisciplinary approach, and that's why it's very difficult to gain um, really rigorous evidence, which is what I'm trained to do at the, uh, through IOPPN, obviously. Um, but if we remain too remote with huge quantitative st uh, studies that don't, aren't actually in touch with the personnel and, and their lives, 
and, and what actually can make a difference, that it, it's not going to work. And I don't think that that much has been learned. In I fully agree with you that what he did was wrong, but we also know that he didn't have a forensic psychiatric assessment, as you say, at that time. And why isn't that happening? Well, I, I can't, I, I can't that answer that. That was a mistake. That was, yeah, that, that was, was a mistake, uh, unfortunate. But, but what, I, I think the point I would say is that when we always, that going back to what I was talking about earlier on, that most psychiatric disorders are, are multifactorial. They very rarely have a single cause, is, is what makes psychiatry so interesting. You mentioned T. Lawrence, but of course, most biographers think that the, his, if he, it's not clear whether he was psychiatrically disturbed or not, but he certainly, he certainly was very affected. The greatest thing that affected him was the shame he felt about the betrayal of the people who had served with him um, in the peace treaty, that he had been uh, sidelined completely from uh, advocating uh, their cause, and this was completely ignored because of the Great Powers Agreement. And I think most historians think that actually, that shame that he felt and uh, that he had betrayed the people who he had himself idolized um, had a greater impact on, on uh, his mental health. And he, of course, he didn't commit suicide, but it's sometimes thought he kind of did, and, and with the, um, which is quite well known. He was in the RAF, and and uh, and the actually death by dangerous driving is is very but by motorcycle driving is very very high in RAF personnel. Yeah. It's the only statistic that you have that where you are far worse than all the other services. I'm talking to the head of, of RAF medical services there, so he knows. So, but that that's, it stands out four yeah. times more likely to die in motorcycle accidents than any other branch of the service. Yeah. So it's com the answer is it's complicated. Thank you. Well, we've, we've, we've lots of questions to get through, so I'm going to move the, this lady here, perhaps. I know you've been waiting very patiently. Thank you. Um, I'm Cheryl D'Souza. I'm a plastic surgeon I'm a, and a King's alumni. Um, one question I do want to ask is um, I've come across a lot of young soldiers uh, who've, who've been uh, employed in either Iraq um, or um, Afghanistan, and they come to plastic surgeons with deliberate self-harm scars. How much work has been done on, on, on this phenomenon? Yeah, I mean... To be, to be honest, I'm, I'm, we haven't had any of our veterans who've presented themselves with that being a particular issue. Um, so I'm not... We, we, we've done stuff on rates of deliberate self-harm, that's true. Um, in general, rates of deliberate self-harm and suicide in the military are actually overall lower than in the general population. People are surprised that they are. The exception being in young men 16 to 19, where they're higher. Um, but cutting, um, yeah. it's not, I don't think it's much well, the, 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 There isn't a huge amount of work done, but certainly for deliberate self-harm, it's there. But what we do in our research is obviously we control for known risk factors. And what we absolutely know is that people who join the, the military, particularly who join the army rather than the Air Force and the Navy, and that's not being unpleasant, it's just the, the, the case, often come from socially disadvantaged backgrounds. And they often have a, a large range of childhood adversities, which is in many cases maybe why they've joined the military. And so I think you you have to be careful to distinguish between what is uh, due, to the, due to their childhood adversity and what is perhaps due to their military service. And I think those two things are, are, are somewhat um, intertwined at times. There was also a, a, a very interesting paper done some years ago by uh, a, a Professor Keith Horton, who basically looked at deliberate self-harm. Actually, it was mostly, to be fair, RAF and, and naval personnel, but in, uh, I think, the Oxford area. And what he found is that people who deliberately self-harm in the military actually sometimes do it because it serves a purpose. So they were much less likely to score high on a suicidal intent scale, yeah, because in the military, if, I mean, I remember when I was at, so I was a medical officer in HMS Invincible, and uh, for when I was halfway through my psychiatric training, and we had people there who didn't want to sail with the ship for you know going away for seven or eight months, and they took overdoses or their self harm because that they saw as a way of trying to get off. And to be fair, most of the time they would have been landed. They would have been sent to shore. Unfortunately for them, they had a psychiatrist on board, so uh, they were able to come away because we could manage the risk, which didn't make them very happy, uh, to be fair. But sometimes self-harm does have a purpose to play, um, and, and so you, you can sort of understand maybe in that context. Thank you. Another question. Uh, yeah, I haven't tried. have been down here. Uh, this lady here, please. Just... Okay. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, my name is Karen Lacey, and I'm a graduate of King's. 
and I'm the daughter of an American naval officer, <laughs> um, and I'm an academic, and my research is into depictions of the military man in popular culture. <laughs> so I'd like to hear what you think about the role of popular culture in this area. For example, stigma. Is it helpful? You know, I'm thinking, for example, of the recent BBC series, The Bodyguard. Uh -huh. Is that helpful? <laughs> Does it open up conversation and reduce stigma, or does it suggest that um, PTSD is more prevalent than it actually is? So anyway, I'd like to, to hear your views on that. Yeah. Um, it's a topic that is obviously quite close to our heart as a charity, because we, we have that dilemma of raising funds, um, but also um, having a responsibility and a duty to make sure that whatever we do, we don't impact on the very thing we're trying to prevent. Um, we found that, particularly with the bodyguard, for example, we've had um, quite a lot of activity on our closed Facebook page, uh, pages. We have a fellowship group um, of about 10,000 veterans um, who provide peer support to each other, socialization, that sort of thing. It's not a membership body, but... Um, and we've noticed quite a lot of activity that we do monitor quite carefully and use monitoring tools to make sure that we're, you know, we're picking up key phrases. And that does create um, some concern when we see um, episodes like that. Um, what we try and do as an organization is to use positive role model images. We think that does have an impact. So the fact that we work very hard with Prince Harry and the Invictus Games, and obviously that's an international effort. Um, to make sure that, you know, the veterans who are taking part, whether they have physical or hidden wounds, are displayed as people who can achieve. Not always elite athletes, because we're quite conscious that has implications as well, that some people can't strive to that. Um, so we, tr we, we, we try and, you know, we try and show those individuals as having family life, as, as being normal and human, um, but being inspirational in their goal, as opposed to necessarily a gold medal. Yeah, I think that's a very difficult question. Um, and indeed, if you look at most of the dramas um, in the last 20 years, and um, big ones, is in, almost invariably one of the principal characters will suffer some form of psychiatric injury. I had a big row with um, Peter Kaminsky, who did Warriors about Bosnia. Really powerful. Do you remember it was two nights on, I think it was BBC, wasn't it? Fantastically moving and strong drama. And it had, um, that, 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 who's the guy, the, the Northern Irish actor who always plays the same part? Um, James Nesbitt. There's a rule that you can't do a film about, about British soldiers without having James Nesbitt in it. And, um, and he's very good at it. And anyway, but we, we met at a wedding. And, and we did research on, on, on Bosnia. So we knew a lot about the rates of disorder. And the thing about that is the three characters who the whole narrative is about all break down. One very severely, two less so, but still severely. And I said, I think it was a pity that you, all your main characters suffered PTSD. And he said, well, they all did. I said, I did, in your film, yes, but obviously we know that those who deployed to Bosnia, they didn't. He said, yes, they did. And I said, no, they didn't. <laughs> and, um, and then I said, why do you say that? He said, well, I went to combat stress, and I'm a trustee of combat stress. This is a combat stress tie. And everyone I interviewed there had PTSD. Well, there's a, possibly a reason why, <laughs> why that might not have been the best and only place to do research. And we had to stop, actually, because we were falling out a bit. And, um, but uh, that, that does worry me. That you get, and it comes down to the distorted image that Neil's talking about, and and, and it's a really difficult dilemma because yeah. you want to talk about the 10, 12 percent who've done very badly from their military service, and it, and if you run a charity as you do and we help as well, that's who we focus on, obviously. But to say that everybody who served will come back damaged really is very unhelpful, and um, and be just what your view on this, and we think in America. That actually has, I think, gone one stage further. Uh, and, um, and, and then you end up seeing people as automatically victims, which is very against the general ethos they have, which is not that they're not victims. And so it, it's, a, it's a very, very sophisticated question. I don't think there's a good answer. What's your answer? <laughs> Yeah, we didn't like, mention yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm looking at more things as well, so I'm looking at Uncle Toby and Tristram Shandy. 
Yeah, okay. Wounds that wouldn't heal. That's right, yeah. But he's supported by his family. Um, but I think in America, um, we, it was the effect of the Vietnam War. Mm. So we, at first, we ignored them and we didn't want to see them, and then we overreacted. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what's interesting about the, the perception of the British military in the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th is that um, far from having a stiff upper lip, we were seen as the crybabies of Europe. And that was, that was absolutely true. And, and crying was a very British thing. And um, do you know where the stiff upper lip was first used? America in the 1830s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we were seen as very, quote, sentimental, which meant we were very prone to tears. Try a question down here. Hi there. Hi. Uh, my name is Cathy Wilkins. I'm a guest here tonight. Very interesting discussion. Um, I also lead the uh, mental health network at one of the big four accountancy firms, which you could see is a different theatre of war maybe sometimes. <laughs> um, one of the issues that we have is engaging men in the mental health discussion, and I wondered if this was something that's also seen in the military. Um, yes is the short answer, but it's not restricted just to, to men. So we absolutely know that women are in the military, and actually in the rest of society, are more likely to seek help for health problems, mental health problems and physical health problems than, than men. But I think the, the thing that we found in, in the military that has worked really well is rather than trying to engage uh, military personnel, male and female, with psychiatrists, you know, we try and engage them with their peers, with their, with their buddies. So, you know, I, I spent good time in the military. I got my commando dagger and all that kind of war -y stuff. But when I turned up, everyone was really keen to see me, but just a little bit busy. Um, and b because, oh, it's the psychiatrist is here. The psychiatrist is here. Oh, thanks, sir. Oh, I'm a bit busy. Bye. You know, that, that was kind of the, the nature of, of the beast. But so instead of reserving your mental health support for professionals who are kind of, you know, we're, we're glad they're there, but they're for someone else. What we spend a lot of time and effort is trying to get mental health support down to the front line. So this program we developed called TRIM, Trauma Risk Management, was a peer support program where we train frontline marines and chefs and aircraft mechanics how to have a structured conversation with a buddy. So you're not relying on speaking strange sort of psychiatric lingo or boffinism or whatever you might want to call it, um, but you, you, you speak a normal language. And actually we find that is much more acceptable. And then once the TRIM practitioner might have identified that their colleague's got a difficulty, that they can A, try and help them simply within the unit, but B, if they really need care, they can metaphorically say, come on, mate, we're going to go, I'm going to take you to the dock. Um, and that has been a really successful way of trying to get people to, to engage with treatment rather than saying, oh, we've got a great suite of therapists over there because no one's going to want to go and see them. But that, 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 that was worry a... stuff is not a word either. <laughs> <laughs> but Trim, I think, was a, was, a, was a Royal Marine initiative, was it not? Um, and did it, did it get pushed out across... All, 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 all the armed services. It did. It started in the Royal Marines, um, and uh, basically, and the research for Trim has all been done. Well, ninety-five percent of it has been done at King's. So um, it, it started in the Marines. Uh, the Navy weren't very keen to take it straight away. The Army and the Air Force were pretty unkeen. And then, as the wars carried on, and we got some funding to do some research, actually, we, we showed that it's a, it didn't do any harm, and it's a credible and you know, yeah. useful way. And, and, that, and that's where it got rolled out. And it's not just used now in, in the military, so the, the BBC, the Foreign Office, uh, train companies, some healthcare. You know, it is not the, it's not penicillin for trauma. It absolutely isn't. But it's a kind of a credible and uh, well-researched uh, peer support initiative. I, I'd really like to try and use that. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Um, right, we've got time for probably two or three more questions. So um, let me, um, the gentleman just here, perhaps. Sorry, the competition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Anthony Pace, King's History, including War Studies, 1961 to 64. <laughs> Golden um, years. Yeah, that's vintage. <laughs> Golden years. <laughs> <laughs> Quick question. Uh, I'm grateful for the, uh, the panel's comment on how anger affects military mental health. I mean, I, I can talk about it non-academically. Um, the, the biggest challenge that, that we find with um, the families that we're helping is anger really gets in the way of, of people, one, seeking help, but also sustaining engagement in some of the, the, 
the services that are available. Um, because there's a, I'll give you an example. I spent some time with, um, with a veteran and his wife very recently because they'd established, both of them, a great deal of trust with the, um, with the support that they had from our service. We deliver a very low-level mental health. You'd call it kind of normally coping strategies to help people cope with their, their symptoms, which is not clinical. It's, um, it, you know, it, it's very low-level. Um, and we spent time with the family because they were concerned they'd lost trust in our services because we'd handed from one person to another. And if I'm really honest, we were very clumsy. What we didn't recognize is that um, the gentleman we were working with has huge anger issues. We knew he had anger issues, but we didn't, we didn't, we didn't really realize the degree to which those would get in the way of him then, one, going home, and also developing trust with a new person. Um, so it really did delay um, his ability to take up the new service. Uh, but at the same time, it also um, prevented him from being in a position where um, he could engage better with his family. So the phrase his wife used was that, you know, I dreaded him walking on the gravel um, of my drive um, because of that anger. So it, it, you know, it certainly gets in the way of, 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 of both help seeking, both sustaining services um, that are there to support them and also being able to do that with the support of the family. Come down here. Uh, <coughs> Hello, it's uh, Robin Philpott. It's many years since I've stood in King's College. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's actually the 50th anniversary of this month of me qualifying as a doctor at King's College Hospital. So that's one of the reasons why I decided <laughs> to come to. <laughs> Uh, the second was that I knew that Simon Wesley was here, so I'd have a laugh. And, uh, I'm pleased to see that we've got an even more humorous people on the panel than him. And thirdly, I think I'm the first person to publish on post-traumatic stress disorder in the British Medical Journal in 1994. It was a single case study in the Grand Round series. And it was a grand round I presented at Liverpool because I was an old age psychiatrist at Liverpool. Yeah. And I'd, on passant, I'd just like to thank you for your... Uh, insult to That's the okay. Republicans, and I'm sure they'll. But I'm sure they'll. I normally I'm, say Sunderland, but yeah, yeah. Play, I'm sure they'll manage. Uh, this very, very standard, very straightforward case of uh, chap who was in his tank in uh, after D-Day in northern France, got out to try and mend the tracks. Somebody hit the tank while he was out. He was knocked out. The whole tank brewed up. Everybody inside was killed. He survived. He'd never got back to frontline combat. He started to drink to forget. He'd been a quite a religious man. He played in the Quaker band, I think, or some, one of the bands in, no, Sally Army. Sally Army band, before he went in. Lost his faith. I'm not drank. sure there's a Quaker band in the military, I must say, unless oh, the right. Quakers have changed. No, no, no. <laughs> before then. Okay. And he then developed all sorts of problems. He had secondary alcoholic problems with hallucinosis. He had personality changes. He, his wife stuck with him. God knows how, but she did. And then he became very depressed. He was referred to me, I think, in his late 70s, perhaps early 80s, because he was suicidal. And we got him to the day hospital, gave him a whole suite of treatments. Uh, I was very suspicious about post-traumatic stress disorder because we'd had the dreadful experience of Hillsborough about three, four years previously, and we had bad experiences of uh, trauma therapists in Liverpool. They all came and descended on the place, and we actually were quite worried about what was going on, and we spoke to the Bradford psychiatrists, because I'd previously worked in Bradford as a consultant. I knew them, asked them over, and they came and talked to us and said, don't have anything to do with the trauma therapists, they're bad news, just hope that another trauma occurs somewhere else, because they'll go, they'll lose interest. And I don't know whether, I think it was probably King's Cross, and they just disappeared, and then we could start to do it. So I had a bad thing about post-traumatic stress disorder. But we treated him, we presented him to the Grand Round at Liverpool, and then I said, let's publish it in the British Medical Journal. This was the very first mental health Grand Round ever published in the British Medical Journal, and the only one, never one subsequently. And it was the first one that was published outside what I would call the uh, magic circle of the London teaching hospitals. And then they started to publish from other places. A couple of things that came out of that was that we had people from the School of Tropical Medicine who dealt with the Far Eastern prisoners of war. 
And they said, we recognize what you're describing and we have these people. I'm sure in our follow-up clinics that we're doing for FIPOs. And I said, I'd be more than happy to see them. And also combat stress got onto me and I said, look, I'd be more than happy to see people from the northwest of England. It doesn't have to be from Liverpool, my catchment area. If they can get to see me, I'll be happy to see them because it was very interesting. You know, I was interested. I didn't get a single referral. The, the one caveat I had with the uh, with the combat stress was that they would have to be 65. And this, I think, really underlines the tremendous reluctance that elderly males particularly would have in admitting to weakness of any sort. Uh, and I think that's still a problem. And I don't think it's just for uh, people who've been in the army. I think it's for male victims of sexual abuse as children have found it very, very difficult to come out and make statements about this. Whilst I was on the train, I live in Bath now, and I was on the train, I remembered eight other patients that I treated. Firstly, in London when I was with Felix Post, one was from the Boer War in the 1970s. Lots from the Second World War, Navy, Army, never had anybody from the Air Force. Very distressed, extremely ill patients. And they all did fantastically well with treatment. I can think of, you know, they were so worthwhile in treating. And so I think we should seek these patients out. I think we should be more active in how we do that. I was pleased to hear you say that we should think about the elderly because my experience has been entirely positive about working with these type of patients. But it's nice to be here. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. I just, so my, my wife's an old age psychiatrist who used to work in Portsmouth, and obviously I've been in the military for years, and so she was doing a liaison psychiatry job on the main ward, and there was a chap who used to be a sergeant major, and he was in for some surgical op and was sort of um, shouting and screaming and stuff. And she went along and spoke to him, and she was quite used to dealing with military types, having met many of my friends. And by her being very direct with him, he was a completely different character. He was no longer the difficult person on the ward. He was just someone who, who was quite direct, and, and she, she got on with him really, really well. And she told the sort of uh, ward staff, you know, that actually if you treat this guy like he's still in the military, which kind of in his head he still was, he will be a lot better off. And, and that made a massive difference. But it was just random she hadn't been married to me. Uh, the, the nursing staff had no idea. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to report that we've now run into the red zone on time. I'm going to get uh, some heavy eyebrows from the seats in front of me unless I uh, bring these proceedings to a close. But uh, I'm very happy to note that immediately after this, uh, we're invited to migrate across uh, the foyer to a reception on the far side where I hope very much we can continue what has already been an extraordinarily stimulating uh, discussion. I think formally, therefore, it just remains uh, for me to thank our panelists, uh, Melanie, Neil, and Simon, for a, an extraordinary contribution to a debate, uh, which I'm sure that um, the King's alumni and supporters and friends uh, will have uh, enjoyed. Uh, and it is a theme uh, that I hope uh, you will all wish to remain engaged with. Uh, and especially through Kings, where, as noted, we are uh, very busily and enthusiastically engaged in pushing the frontiers of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, you've been most welcome. Uh, that welcome, welcome, I hope, continues uh, over the other side. Um, but uh, from me, many thanks indeed. <laughs>